now, let's join Ace Broadcaster Mamode Akuga as he takes us inside the Niger Delta. Hello out there and welcome to the program. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. I'm your regular host, Mamode Akuga. In less than four months from now, Bielsa will go to the polls to elect for themselves a new governor to pilot the affairs for the next four years. The next governor of Bielsa State is expected to consolidate on the achievements of outgoing governor Seriaka Dixon and possibly break new grounds for further development of the state. For a state with an unenviable record of electoral violence, there seems to be a growing concern over the credibility of the forthcoming elections. And the people's recipe for non-violent polls is the focus of our first issue in today's package. By now, it's no longer news that Professor Charles Quakers, Dokubo, coordinator of the Presidential Amnesty Program and Special Advisor to the President on Niger Delta matters, is under serious pressure to unmask perpetrators of the Valentine's Day looting of the Amnesty Vocational Training Center in Kayama, the cradle of the armed struggle against perceived marginalization in the Niger Delta. The outcome of the February looting is our second issue in this edition of the program. And next in our lineup is how the oil-producing communities of Imo State have fared since the establishment in 2007 of the Imo State Oil Minerals Producing Areas Development Commission, ISOPADEC. And finally on the program is the People's Verdict on the life and times of Pa Gabriel Imamotimi Okara, the late literary giant from Bielsa State who recently embarked on a journey of no return to his final resting place. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region will be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, determined to make a difference. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, it's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. Last month, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, confirmed a new date for the upcoming governorship election in Bielsa State, which will now hold on November 16, 2019. Ahead of the polls, political consultations, alignments, realignments are already taking place in the various parties that will be vying for the office of the governor of Bielsa State. But how Biosans will decide who becomes their next governor has become a source of concern for the voting public in the state, with a track record of massive electoral violence, as correspondent Tekena Miofuri reports. Bielsa State, the cradle of Nigeria's hydrocarbon industry, where crude oil was first explored and exploited on a commercial scale in the 1950s, is among the richest states of the Federation. Over the years, there has been a fierce competition among the political class over the control of state resources, leading to widespread use of violence to intimidate perceived opponents during elections. In the month of February this year, during the presidential and national assembly elections, several innocent lives were lost to the beatings of merchants of violence in the state. Among victims of election violence was Mr. Reginald Day, a photojournalist attached to Government House Yenogua, who was shot in his line of duty at Southern Ijo local government area. Others killed during the last elections were Seyidoa Taribi, a chieftain of the People's Democratic Party in Southern Ijo, and one Braye Mbikoro, an APC supporter. We need to ca call the attention of those that are sponsoring violence. We cannot say we don't know them. Even if we don't know them, there is need to advise them in general. Most Bielsans deeply troubled by unbridled violence unleashed during elections are getting increasingly apprehensive as the next governorship election gets underway in November. Most likely there will be violence. And uh, we have been trying our best to see how it is minimized. And we pray that it will be minimized uh, so that we don't lose any soul because we are contesting election. Politicians should do well to educate their members, their followers, 
on how they conduct themselves in time of party, um, what they call it, uh, campaigns, and even the election proper. In response to widespread violence characterizing the February elections in Bayelsa State, Governor Henry Seriake Dixon has set up a judicial panel to investigate the incident and make recommendations on how to bring an end to political intolerance in a state he fondly refers to as the Jerusalem of all Ijo people. I want to call on all of you who saw what happened in Nimbe Basambri, who saw what happened, who have video clips, who have recordings, who know of the conspiracies who know of the participants to forward your reports and complaints to this commission of inquiry. They have done what they have done. I know it is tempting, but I want to call all of you not to join issues with them. Don't meet violence with violence. The group of politicians in the state, of which former President Goodluck Jonathan is a member, now considers it imperative to complement the governor's efforts with the launch of a campaign against electoral violence. We must play down violence in our politics. There is no nation all over the world that developed through violence. Even if you look at the most developed countries in the world, those are the most peaceful countries too. So if Bayelsa State will develop, there must be peace in this, uh, in this state. And we must start from the political process. Because most of the criminal gangs that have emerged in this city grew through political activities, the way the politicians used them as boys and thugs. And at the end of the election, it becomes a problem to manage them. Operating under the banner of Ijo Elders Forum, the group met recently in Yenagu at the Bayelsa State Capital to reflect on the huge losses attendant on electoral violence. In their recent meeting, the protagonists of peaceful pools in Bayelsa State had enunciated a code of conduct which politicians must follow to drastically reduce violence during elections. We must decide today to be decent in our campaigns, voting and in our reaction to the final results. Elections to public offices must be based on acceptability of the electorate. Elections must not be contest contested and won based on much touted federal might. It must be contested and won based on free will of voters. Every politics is local. Voters must not be intimidated by threat of violence. We must resolve today to depart from this path. Every democratic society is tailored after the ideological concept of freedom, welfare, equality, solidarity, and progress. And the program should not end today. Because the process of selecting political leaders takes a journey. I think after this time, we should also do one for those who will be at the local government level. There is the need to improve local government administration in this state, and not just this state, in the whole country. In Nigeria's recent history, widespread violence continues to compromise the integrity of elections and has taken a huge toll on governance and Bayelsa State is a classic reference point in this ugly narrative. For the ordinary citizens who are at the receiving end of political intolerance, a campaign for peaceful elections championed by the politicians themselves is certainly most welcome, as it holds out the possibility of light at the end of a long tunnel of electoral violence in Bayelsa State. Inside the Niger Delta over 16 weeks after the vocational training center of the presidential amnesty program was besieged and looted in Kayama local government area of Bayelsa State, those responsible for the dastardly act are yet to be apprehended and prosecuted. Consequently, some groups in the Niger Delta region are calling on Professor Charles Dokubo, coordinator of the presidential amnesty program, to step aside to allow for an independent investigation into the incident. Correspondent Chika Obodozie has details. On Thursday, February 14, 2019, residents of Boro Town in Kayama local government area of Bayosa State and their accomplices from neighboring communities vandalized the Presidential Amnesty Vocational Training Center 
and cutted away starter packs and other items valued at billions of naira. The looters reportedly carried out their looting act after overpowering security guards deployed to protect the facility. The free-for-all, however, lasted five whole days, prompting observers to conclude that there is more to the Kayama looting than meets the eye. The vandalization did not take place in minutes, hours. It took place in days. That, I think, is a well-planned, orchestrated act against the people of, against the amnesty program, also against the people of the community, putting the community in the forefront of all of this. If they overpowered the people on the first day, what also happened on the second day and the third day? The state could not bring in forces, reinforcement to protect the place. You have the community. You have the community leaders. You have the people of the community. They are known. So if it's an investigation, it's an investigation of a known target. What kind of public authority will stay for three days without stopping a looting and stay for the fourth day and up to now without recovering what is looted and we are still waiting for an investigation report? The vandalized vocational training center, one of several such facilities provided across the Niger Delta to transform the largely unskilled youths into a skilled workforce, had just been commissioned and was ready for use. Disturbed by this incident, Professor Charles Dokubo had in the month of March this year set up a six-man panel to identify the culprits and recommend appropriate sanctions for those found culpable. The panel was given seven working days to submit its report, yet nothing has been heard of its findings three months after it was set up. Professor Dokubo's failure to unmask perpetrators of the amnesty office looting to face sanctions is consequently generating concern in the Niger Delta, with several youth groups calling on him to step aside to allow for a full-scale probe into the looting of the Presidential Amnesty Vocational Training Center in Borough Town. Professor Dokubo directed the head of Borough Town Vocational Training Center, Mr. Jude, Barboyo to open the warehouse where supplies items are kept and they arrange with hoodlums to cut away items previously supplied to cover up their fraud. The move is to enable Dr. Bo, his frontline men, and the director of procurement and other senior management staff in the amnesty office to claim that the 13 billion worth of supply items have been stolen by hoodlums. The looting of the facility lasted for five days with no police or military personnel to stop the hoodlums. We are here to call on Mr. President Mohamed Buhari to have Professor Charles Dokubo, coordinator of the Amnesty program, step aside. For the criminal investigation to commence into the uninterrupted five days looting of the 60 billion Naira training complex in Kayama Bayasa State. For some group of persons to think that Professor Charles Dokubo you know, a scholar of in, an international report, this, a scholar of international report to condescend so low to go and organize to loot items that the federal government spent millions and billions to procure for the empowerment of the people of Nigeria. That, I mean, that is unfair. For those who have closely followed the course of events in the last four months, Professor Dokubo's response to an alleged complicity in the February looting of the Amnesty Vocational Training Center apparently has not been followed with the swiftness of action required to put the record straight. The fact that no report has come, no action has been taken, will make any third party conclude that they have an interest in it and in its outcome and that's why they are sitting on it. Not only that, the panel has not finished work, but there has been no consequence for the panel not finishing work. And there has been no explanation to society as to why that work has not been finished till now. Nobody is crying hue and foul about it from those who are expecting the report. So if they are not worried about the report not coming out, it creates the impression that they want the thing swept after carpet after some time. And that makes those suggestions in public minds that, oh, they must have an interest in what happened and in the sweeping aside of what happened, sweeping under the carpet of what happened. Because they are not bothered about the fact that the report is not coming and they are not taking any other steps and they are not talking about it. They are not offering the public any explanation. So you cannot blame those persons who felt that expectation from government uh, that was coming to them has been uh, uh, taken away from them. You cannot blame them for having that feeling. 
The delay in unmasking masterminds of the Kayama looting amounts to concealing the truth and deferring accountability. Moreover, it is an infringement on the people's right to know who is actually responsible for the dastardly act. It is on this note that concerned Niger Deltans are calling for a public declaration of the investigative panel's report without any further delay. Inside the Niger Delta. To your surprise, it is this blue oil that is being supplied all over the, the, the filling station. Federal government is only telling us they are bringing fuel from here, they are bringing fuel from here, they are bringing fuel from here. All the fuel they are bringing is from the creek. You mean that the fuel that people are buying? Yes, they are all from the creek. They are the ones locally refined They are all from the creek. Yes, Delta, yes the creek. those are the ones we are buying in the filling station. How are you sure? Yes, we are sure because we are seeing it. They are the same thing that they are putting in the tank, bringing in the filling station, selling us. We have not seen any imported fuel in the Niger Delta. So long as the federal government does not have this, the, the, the political will to open the mobile refinery, this poor fuel business will not going to stop. But do you know that it is illegal? It is against Nigeria. It is law. illegal, Nigerian but it's law yes, to, Nigerian to law, this, yes, to, but it's our to, oil. It's our oil. If you want to stop us, you must make a provision for us. It's our oil. We went to speak with these boys to stop this business, that these mobile refineries are coming. But the federal government does not have the spiritual will to stop the business. So the blue oil must continue. Even if they bring the soldiers and police to arrest the people? Arrest. They, 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 they have been arresting. They are all part of the business. They are used to it. They are all part of the business. No matter soldiers you bring, no matter police you bring, they are all part of the business. So there is no way you can stop it. It cannot stop. It can only stop if the federal government has the political will to say, okay, this is what we have for you people. Then we cannot speak with the people, stop this business. But so long as the federal government does not have this political will to bring this mobile refinery to our community, they want to stay in Abuja to sell license without coming to do proper, proper, it will not going to work. Inside the Niger Delta. All producing communities in Imo State can now heave a sigh of relief following the administrative neglect and abandonment as the Imo State Oil Minerals Development Commission, ISOPADEC, established about 12 years ago to cater for the development needs, appears to have woken up from its slumber. This report correspondent Obioma Oboroga takes a look at the impact of ISOPADEC on Ohaji Egbema and Oguta, the two oil producing local government areas of Imo State. This report is presented from our studios. The Imo State Oil Producing Areas Development Commission, ISOPADEC, was established through an Act of Parliament in 2007 to promote rapid development in the oil producing communities. To this end, the law establishing the commission provides that 40% of the 13% oil derivation revenues accruable to the state be set aside to fund the commission. Over the years, Isopadek was crippled by inadequate funding by successive governments as it could not do much to transform the oil-producing communities. During a recent visit to the communities, it was however observed that the commission was making renewed efforts to offer the communities a new lease of life with the provision of critical infrastructure such as roads, schools and markets. We very much appreciate and we thank the government that have done this for us. There's much improvement. The former one wasn't like this. They will have gotten a, a better site and much improvement on the market. And I think it's going to boost the economy of the villagers too. Many children have deserted this school because of uh, the dilapidated uh, building. We are feeling very, very happy. In short, we don't know how to express our joy. We are very grateful. We appreciate. Efforts made so far to develop the oil producing communities are in spite of the many challenges Isopadek has had to contend with over the years. The Commission's Managing Director, Andrew Moketubo, says Isopadek is determined to succeed against all odds. 
Since there were inadequate funds to meet the needs of the people at this time, we have to allocate the resources according to order of needs. We started by visiting the communities and doing what we call need assessment program, where we have to talk with the stakeholders, the chiefs, the youths, the women, and all other components of the communities and uh, know their immediate needs. We gathered the problems and we started profiling. We started solving them according to order of needs and uh, within the limits of available resources. Woketubu speaks further on what the commission has done to bring succor to the impoverished oil producing communities. Within one year of my administration, I have carried out over 40 projects that are accessible in various communities, and these are life touching projects. The oil producing communities of Imo State, which had it not so good in the past, are quite expectant as they look forward to a new deal under the administration of Governor Emeka in Hedioha. Inside the Niger Delta. Writers, scholars, and intellectuals from diverse fields of human endeavors recently converged in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, to celebrate the late pa Gabriel Okara, a literary icon from the Niger Delta who committed his entire life to the propagation and enhancement of the African culture in his writings. Friends, close associates, and family members of the late multiple award-winning writer while describing his exit as the end of an era in the Niger Delta prevailed on the younger generation to imbibe his telling qualities in their search for self-actualization. Correspondent Tekena Mifuri has more. It was an evening of tributes organized by a Port Accord based lawyer, Angus Chukuka, a boarding writer inspired by the writings of the late Gabriel Okara. The occasion was not graced by high-profile politicians and state officials, but few friends and close associates of Gabriel Okara found time to be part of an event designed as a post-mortem of his immense contributions to the advancement of African literature and culture. You know, my interaction with this man, he proved to be a special man, special in character, unassuming. You would think that with the height he have attained, he would be snobbish. He would have no time for you. But he gave all the attention to me more than I deserve. And when I asked around, it was the same way he treated everyone. Gabriel Okara was a good man. Born on April 24, 1921, in Bomondi, Bayelsa State, Gabriel Okara developed a strong attachment to his Ijo culture at a very young age and was able to propagate its values to the international community in an age of Western cultural imperialism. Okara's designation as the pathfinder of modern African literature is attributed to his originality and innovation in communicating the African experience to the rest of the world. The voice reveals Okara's vast knowledge of the Ejo oral tradition. It resonates with his rebellion against the principle of the colonialist imposing his language on the colonized, even in aesthetics, by showing how Okara fervently uses English words to literally bring out the thought processes of the Ijo people and dictated by the syntax, lexis, semantics, and even phonology of his own language. Gabriel Okara's friends say, they are proud to be associated with him as he was able to bring his literary prowess to bear in public administration in his lifetime. When I went to government college my I began to get a feeling of Gabriel Okara. And uh, I kept on sort of following the name until I eventually met him. And from the moment I met him, I took him as my senior brother. And uh, that's the way I looked at him and worked with him until his death. Mr. Gabriel Okara has left footprints to make each and every one of us proud. He has paid his debt to this world. Only history 
will continue to document his contributions to the nation he served so loyally and diligently. The late Gabriel Okara was a cultural nationalist whose works have shaped humanity across cultures. Others present at the recent evening of tributes in honor of Gabriel Okara, however, call on the present generation to emulate his lifestyle to change the current narrative in the Niger Delta. He never put money first. He never thought of uh, collecting money for any one of his works. So if they can be like Pa Gabriel, maybe now that he has passed away, reflecting upon his character and learning one or two things from him, it will go a long way to change the way we think. Gabriel Okara's demise on the 24th of March this year is mourned as a great loss across the Niger Delta, particularly for the government of Bayelsa State, which plans a state burial for the ingenious master of words. Inside the Niger Delta. And with that report, we'll wrap it up on the program, Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. The program will be back same time next week on this station. You can follow us on our social media handles showing right now on your screen. On behalf of the production crew, I remain yours sincerely, Mamude Akuga, thanking you for staying tuned. Bye for now. <music>